You are a gifted person from Almighty God. The day you become a Christian, do you know you are gifted from Jesus? You are gifted from Almighty God. Hey guys, I love you deeply, and today you need this topic. I, I need this topic too. Uh, we both do. Um, some of us right now, we are living the life God intended, and you sense it, you see it, people know it. Others are not, you're, you're missing out. We, grace, is also missing out. So, uh, based on this topic, I was thinking about it, and I was reminded of a story from years ago, a, a trip to Washington, D.C. So, uh, it was a summer vacation. Uh, years ago, Kathy and I, uh, Jacob and Karina, we'd like an East Coast swing, and one of the places we visited was D.C., and we got a chance to go to Mount Vernon. So, Mount Vernon is the home of George and Martha Washington, um, and technically, it was Martha's place. Like, he married into the family, married into money. But then now it's theirs. And walking through Mount Vernon, it's amazing. This is their home, You're their, their actual home. At one point, we get to see the famous Udon bust. Udon bust. And so here's, a, I think, a photo of that kind of uh, area. I think it might be, you can see that's their home. And it's a 360 walk around this statue, this bust of George Washington's face. Udon, by the way, I'll tell you the backstory of this. Udon is actually a French name, a French word. It, we'd say... Houdon, H-O-U-D-O-N, but since he was French, it's Houdon. And so uh, at the time, George Washington was 53 years old. He's the most famous person in the world at 53. Houdon is the most famous painter, sculptor, or sculptor in the world, and uh, very busy, but he made an exception, carved out time to travel to the United States and visit 53-year-old George Washington. And so he Udon brought three French assistants with him. Udon did not speak a word of English, not a word. But he just followed him around for two straight weeks, watching his face. He followed him to every single meal, watched his countenance. He followed him to every single business meeting, looking at the looks that came onto his face. He even went to a funeral and a wedding. And he's looking for that perfect moment which captures the spirit, the essence of George Washington. Couldn't find the moment. So one day, Udon was watching uh, as a horse trader came onto uh, the property, and George Washington thought the guy was cheating him, ripping him off. And he got this look on his face, this whether it's stern, uh, intense, angry look. Here's, here's an actual picture of the Udon bust. There it is. So I'll never forget this moment. So my family, we walk into the area, and I take one look at that, that statue, that face. And I, I, it takes my breath away. <laughs> and I think to myself, can I think that? that? I don't know if that's even true. Is that true? I shouldn't be thinking that. But I kept it quiet. And Kathy separately, we got the kids there. We walked through it. And we, we, Kathy and I were talking about this recently. At some point, we brought up, I maybe brought up, you know, hey, what'd you think? Did you see anything about the George Washington? She goes, yes, that is your face when you get angry. <laughs> and uh, she's right. I, I'll, I kid you not. I walked in that area. I was not expecting it. I took one look at his face. Kathy says it's the bottom half of the face. I argue maybe be a little bit of the eyes too, but that is my angry face. <laughs> and uh, based on that, it's such a, such a moment. And, and by the way, the face doesn't appear that often, thankfully. Not soon angry, not often angry. Uh, but every vacation, I try to pick out a souvenir that represents it. So um, I actually bought this souvenir. I brought it home. This is, this is George. Say hi, George. Uh, I have him there. It's a great memory of this. But this topic today reminds me of George. Not the angry part, not the stern part, uh, not the facial part. But it, this is exactly what I'm talking about today. Are you living the life God made you for? He intended you for that. So let's have a word of prayer. God, I just pray that you would uh, lead us by your Holy Spirit. I ask you to lead me. Um, the words 
heart, face, whole body, that your Holy Spirit might speak to every single person engaging with this message through your word. God, please help people to see who you made them to be, how you designed them. May they live out their calling, their purpose in life. For those who don't know Jesus, please, please, please call them to salvation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are in a year of personal evangelism, focusing on that as a church. Uh, our year is called One Message. Our hope is by the end of this year, we've inspired and equipped and challenged and educated and motivated and God's spirit has moved in your life. So now guess what? We're all fanning out to those around us. We are going to people around us. We are starting conversations, asking people about them. And do you have anything you have faith in? Then we're sharing, can I share what I have faith in? And we share Jesus. The fact that he died and rose and was seen, was seen, was seen. And he is alive and he, he's changed our life. The verse I'm praying for you and for me is, is Mark chapter five, verse 19. Jesus heals a man and tells him, like I believe he would tell all of us at Grace Church, to go. Go home. Go home to your friends. Go home to your friends and tell them. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things God has done for you. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things God has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. That's personal evangelism or like personal good news sharing. That is our desire this year. This weekend, Sunday night, February 5th, 6.30 at our South Omaha Park campus. I'll be sharing my heart and more importantly, God's heart on this year. You're gonna hear us talk about the rest of the year, the monthly challenges, initiatives we have with our church. Don't miss it. Join me. So right now we're on a series about our vision. Our vision here at Grace is to help everyone become an outward focused follower of Jesus. That's our vision. We've been taking three weeks, this is week three, to unpack our vision in reverse order from the most important part, Jesus, to today's topic. Jesus, we started two weeks ago talking about Jesus. We said the dream. What is the dream with Jesus here at Grace? That Jesus would be our first love, our greatest joy, and our one message. That's my dream, my hope. That's our dream, our hope, that you would love Jesus more than you love anything and anyone. He's your first love, my first love, that he's your greatest joy and my greatest joy. I had great joy with the Chiefs winning the conference championship, but my greatest joy, our greatest joy, still is in Jesus, always will be, and he's our one message. People walk away, they hear us talk most, most passionately, most compassionately about Jesus. That was week one. Our vision is to help everyone become an outward focused follower of Jesus. Last week we talked followers of Jesus. What's it mean? Our dream as followers of Jesus and grace is we seek Jesus continually and do whatever he wants. You and I are constantly seeking Jesus, looking to him, praying, seeking his direction. And whatever he tells us, we do that. That's what followers of the King do. That's our dream, to help you help me, I help you follow Jesus. So this week, we're going to very, back to the very start of our vision state, statement, which is helping everyone become. We desire all people to be helpful, all of us to be used by the Holy Spirit of God to be helpful as we help everyone become followers of Jesus. What's the dream here? The dream is this, that all of us are helping others love and follow Jesus. All of us are actively helping other people love and follow Jesus. To the men, who are you helping at grace to love and follow Jesus? To the women, who are you actively helping these days? They love Jesus more because of your influence. They're following Jesus better. To the students, to the kids, are you helping other people, fellow students, kids, and others, Love and follow Jesus, that is the dream. Every single one of us engaged with ministering for Jesus Christ. We're gonna be over in Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four. I'll tell you about the book of Ephesians real quickly. It's just a short book. You can read it in one sitting very easily. It's only six chapters. We're gonna be in Ephesians four, one through 16. Paul is sitting in jail when he writes a local church. This uh, happens to be a church he actually started and pastored for a number of years then turned over the pastoral leadership and kept moving on planting churches. 
This is the book, Ephesians, that reveals uh, most completely that the church is just like a human body, like your body, my body. Jesus is the head. We're the body parts. He's the leader. He's the visionary. He's the one who speaks through us. We're the body parts, the hands and feet in this world, the part that people can see. That's this book. The church is just like a body, Jesus' body. Today we're going to see uh, three things that Jesus gives every single Christian. Three things he's given you. If you're a Christian, he's given you. We're going to talk about whether you know about that's a gift to you and whether you value it. And then one thing he calls every single Christian to do. One thing he calls every Christian to do. Let's start. look at the first thing that Jesus gave you. He gave me. I became a Christian at 19. I got this gift at 19. I didn't know it yet, but it happened. Ephesians 4 verse 1 to 4 says this. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, he's sitting in jail, beseech you. He's not about begging. I beg you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. You were called. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring, working to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, that's the church, one body, and one Spirit, one Holy Spirit. Just as you were called, there it is again, you were called in one hope of your calling. What's he talking about here? If you take your notes, you can write this. Jesus gives a divine calling to every Christian. Jesus gives a divine calling, a calling from Almighty God to every Christian. If someone asked you, if you're a Christian, do you have a divine calling on your life? Most likely, you would say no. <laughs> and I totally get that. I remember being a new Christian or a growing Christian. I'm like, divine calling, what are you talking about? Because it's not what you expect. You expect like to be sitting in church or out in the wilderness, you know, somewhere and a light shines on you, a voice comes down, and now you get this calling. You see, I received my divine calling when I was 19. It was in Blue Springs. After a Bible study, when I prayed, dear Jesus, save me, be my Lord and Savior. In that very moment, I got saved, forgiven of sin, a child of God, adopted in this family. I received a divine calling. You received a divine calling from God, a calling that's about one Lord, one Holy Spirit, one body, one hope, one faith, one baptism. That's about his upside down kingdom in this world. You've been called to be a minister of the gospel in this world, a body part in the body of Christ. You have been called to have a different spirit. When people sense you, when they interact with you, they sense humility. Yeah, that I don't see anywhere else. That's what he says in verse two. This divine calling you receive to be part of God's kingdom, be a minister of his. But you're not arrogant. You're the opposite of arrogant. You have lowliness, gentleness, long suffering. You put up with people in love and you're always working to keep the unity of the Holy Spirit in this connection of peace. Did you know that you have a divine calling from God? You do have a divine calling. A calling to be part of God's kingdom in God's body to glorify him and spread the good news of Jesus all around the world. You were called. What else has he given you? As you read Ephesians 4, uh, look at verse 7 and 8. You see the second of the gifts I want to talk about. You receive not just a divine calling, uh, but look at the word Gifts here. You'll see those just pop out, these two verses, the word gifts. He says this, verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, and he quotes Psalm 68, when he, Jesus, ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts to men. Gave gifts to men. So what's the second gift? Not only did he give you a divine calling if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, he did this also. Jesus gives spiritual gifts to every Christian. He gives spiritual gifts to every single Christian. And I know there might be people out there who are thinking to themselves, now, 
he doesn't do have just spiritual gift. Isn't everything I have from God? Yes. Yes, James chapter one talks about that. James one and two. Every gift comes from God. If it's a good gift, it came from you, not from God. Life. You as, Jesus gave you life, life as a gift to you. He gave you your natural abilities. Some painting and creativity or organization or math. Like you got those at birth. Those are gifts to you, natural abilities. He gave you opportunity. He gave you resources. All of these are gifts. And he also gave you three gifts he lists here. Look at what it says in verse seven. You see two gifts in verse seven, one gift in verse eight. To each one of us, that's Christians in the church, grace was given. Grace is undeserved favor, undeserved power, undeserved presence of God. God gave you the gift of grace, acceptance, power, presence. You never earned. He just gave it to you. And what was the measuring cup he used to pour out God's grace on you? He says, according to the measure of Christ's gift. Okay, so Jesus died on the cross. The infinite sacrifice, infinite love, infinite forgiveness. When Jesus poured out his grace on you, he says, well, don't, don't measure it all. Just make it measureless. Just pour. It's the Christ's gift. That's the measuring stick. Grace and grace and grace. Just pours out his grace on you. And he says in verse, verse eight, he talks about your spiritual gifts. He says, when he ascended on high, that's when Jesus visited heaven, what did he do? He led captivity captive. He led prison, a prison break. Captivity was the old t- name for the Old Testament place. Old Testament saints used to go because they couldn't go to heaven when they died. Jesus hadn't died yet. They went to a temporary holding cell, a place. A place was peaceful and restful called prison. <laughs> and he led captivity to heaven. Now they're there. And what do you do? Also, he gave you and I gifts, spiritual gifts. What are the spiritual gifts? There are some 20 to 25 spiritual gifts, depending on you group them, 20 to 25 spiritual gifts in the New Testament. You've been given uh, one or more of those spiritual gifts. You can find the key chapters on spiritual gifts at the 12s and 4s, 12s and 4s, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4 here, 1 Peter 4. Those four chapters lay out the spiritual gifts. What are spiritual gifts? They're a way God uniquely designed you to serve where his spirit is unleashed in this world. God's power flows through you. Those 20 to 25 spiritual gifts are divided into two chunks, speaking gifts and serving gifts. Some people have speaking gifts. Some have serving gifts. Some have both. What are the speaking gifts? Teaching. Some people are just gifted teachers. God speaks spiritually through them. Some are gifted encouragers. They come alongside people and say, you can do this. Like you're gifted and encouragement. Some are gifted with the word of wisdom. That moment to put in words, in simplicity, what is the wise path, the wise decision right now? Speaking gifts, do you have? Speaking spiritual gifts from Almighty God. There are serving gifts as well. Mercy, a spiritual gift, not my gift. I I have mercy, just I'm not very gifted (laughs) at it. Thank God he has people with the gift of mercy in our church because we need each other. Nobody's gifted at everything. He gives us some of the gifts, but not all of them. Giving, that's a spiritual gift. Administration, there I am. Uh, The gift of administration. If you're a Christian, you receive one or more spiritual gifts. These are tools God designed. He gave you tools to be used for Almighty God, not for your benefit, but for our benefit. Because you're a body part. You're a hand, you're an eye, you're a spleen, you're a lung, you're a foot. You have unique giftings. Everybody has unique giftings. How do you discover like, what, is, what are your spiritual gifts? Could you take a, a pen and paper and write down, well, these are my primary spiritual gifts? How do you know? Two ways to find out your spiritual gifts. One, you can take a test. We do have a test at our website, visitcreatures.com. Log in, create an account, log in. You can take, our, I believe, our spiritual gifts test. That's an okay way to do it. The better way, start doing stuff. Start ministering in the church. Start serving in ministry because guess what? People will go all American Idol on you all around you without it being asked. What they'll do, they'll be like judge panel. Like they'll be, man, you are so good at mercy. You're so good at teaching. You got to do more of this. And they'll be like, that's pity, dog. I'm not sure. You're not that good at, you're not that good at this. That's okay. Others are good at that. But you know what you're good at? This. Everybody, you are a gifted person from Almighty God. The day you become a Christian, I received my gifts when I said, dear Jesus, save me. I was 19. I had no idea what they were. So I started doing stuff, 
growing spiritually, people affirm that. Do you know you are gifted from Jesus? You are gifted from Almighty God. Do you value those gifts? Do you treasure those gifts? You gave me not just a divine calling from you, but you gave me how I serve in the body, how you use me in your kingdom, my spiritual gift set. You're a gifted person if you're a Christian. A spiritual gifted person. So now let's talk about the third gift. You'll see that uh, as we read down in verse 11 to 13. Look for the word pastors, the word pastors. Ephesians 4, 11 says this. And he himself gave, there's the gifting. Jesus gave something. He gave four different offices, four more spiritual gifts. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Why? For the edifying of the body of Christ. How long? Well, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay, what's he talking about here? He's talking about in general church leadership, but specifically Jesus gives, if you're taking notes, Jesus gives pastors to every Christian. Jesus gives as a gift pastors to the church, pastors to every single Christian. And as I wrote this point, I laughed. As I say this point, I laugh because I'm picturing somebody sitting out there going, did, did Tim just call himself God's gift to the church? And yeah, yeah. Our whole pastoral team, every pastor is God's gift to the church. I'm not saying it's a great gift sometimes or a perfect gift, but absolutely. You, it's not emotionally I feel that. I'm reading the words. He gave four offices, apostles, or we call today missionaries, prophets, the second role, or we call preachers, evangelists, reaching people for Christ, and pastors and teachers. Well, that's not two roles. In Greek, there's no word and. It's literally and pastor teachers. What am I? I'm a pastor teacher. That's the two sides of my role. And God gave me and the rest of our pastoral team to you at Grace Church. We absolutely are gifts from Almighty God to you at Grace Church. Why are we given by Jesus? To help you. What do we do? We pastor and teach. Teaching is like the feeding of the sheep. You gather, we work on the feeding, making sure there's a spiritual nourishment from the youngest new Christian, the 40-year-old new Christian, the milk of the Bible, all the way up to the, the most challenging meats of Scripture, the harder places, the, the things, the proteins you need and the full diet. We work on feeding you and shepherding, protecting you, leading you, sensing God's Spirit, following Jesus, becoming a model. We are absolutely gifts to you to watch out for you. And I laugh because Jesus gives pastors to every Christian. Don't you know Christians not in church? What is a Christian that's not in church? Two things. First of all, irrelevant. Not mentioned in Scripture. Now, not irrelevant to me or Jesus. But you know God doesn't talk about Christians not in church? Because he can't fathom it. Because the day you become a Christian, you have a church. You don't like your church? He says God, went, then change churches. But God calls you to have a church. And in that church, he's given pastors. These imperfect journey people on the same journey with you that you can grow. What are people doing? Uh, they are sometimes rejecting. It's like giving a gift. Hey, do you want this? Jesus says, do you want the gift? Like, no, thank you. God, if you're a Christian, gave you a divine calling. You have a higher purpose, a calling from Almighty God to be part of his kingdom and his body. And he equips you. He gave you spiritual gifts, your unique spiritual gifts, showing where in the body you serve the best. He unleashes his power, his grace through this world. And he gave you a local church and pastors to feed you, protect you, help grow you spiritually. Based on these three gifts, calling, spiritual gifts, pastors, he calls every Christian to do something. Let's look at that. Ephesians 4, uh, verse 14 to 16. Look for the word every. The word every appears three times. Ephesians 4, verse 14 says this. That we should no longer be children, that's spiritual children, tossed to and fro 
and carried about with every, first time I mentioned, every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up, may mature spiritually, grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, that's the church, that's you and me, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying, the building up of itself in love. What's he talking about here? I think, I believe he's talking about this. Jesus calls every Christian to help their church spiritually. That's what he does. He calls you and me to help our church. Grace Church is my church too. Help our church spiritually. Are you, if you're a part of Grace, helping our church spiritually grow? Get more united, get strengthened, reach out. Are you doing it? There's two parts to that. The church, both, both having a church and helping with church. First of all, having a church. Do you have a church? Is a church in this world your church? Is it your church? I was talking to a friend of mine at our North Orlando Park campus earlier this week, uh, Terry Anthony, and let me just, I, I get a chance just to encourage him. I've watched God use him to not only help get the North Orlando Park facility ready with tons of painting and organization, but he leads a grace group. I, even more than that, I just see him impact people. Like he encourages and teaches and comes alongside and motivates and has a desire to disciple people. And I'm talking to Terry because he, he misspoke and it made me laugh, but it's not perfect for this illustration. Because he, he said, I want, Tim, I want a meeting with you. I want to talk to you about something. I said, well, let's talk now. He says, I got a question about your church. And I said, Terry, do you mean our church? <laughs> And he laughs. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the other thing, the last thing on Terry's mind, he doesn't think it's like your church. It's, it's my church to him. It's our church. Is grace or some other church your church? If not, what is happening? He gave you gifts that way. Are you helping your church? Why would you help in your church? Verse 14, here's what's at stake. There's every wind of doctrine. People who are spiritual children, read things on the internet, watch videos, hear people's comments, watch uh, social media posts, read the, watch the news, and they're blown back and forth, back and forth. They're unstable. And there are cunning people trying to deceive people out there. How do you avoid that? Verse 15, speaking the truth in love. You realize that you can only grow so much if you learn the truth. At some point, God calls you. This person, you're not going to grow beyond it until you start speaking the truth. You open your eyes. You're sharing God's truths with others the best way you know how. And when you start doing that, you grow up in him into the head in all things. Here comes the two everys. From the, the whole body, the whole church body, we are joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. I have a wrist, that's a joint. I have an elbow, that's a joint. I've got a neck, that's a joint. What are joints? Connections between body parts. In the church body, what are joints? Relationships. Relationships. Every relationship you have in the church supplies something good. And then he says, every part in verse 16 needs to be doing its share. And when every joint is supplying things and every part doing its share, there's growth of the body and the edifying itself. Your divine calling is lift, uh, lived out. Your spiritual gifts are being used. You're connected under the guidance and head leadership of your pastors in your local church. And Jesus wins. You, everybody wins. I mean, here's my question. He talks about every single joint, every single part. So what about the joints around you, the connection between you and other members of grace? What are the relationships, like beyond just your family, the relationships, the friendships you are building here at Grace in ministry or in our Grace groups or our outreach teams or our huddles or short-term studies, what are those relationships doing for the church body? Are you, through your relationships, supplying more of God's power into this world, to the body of Grace Church? Or 
Do all your relationships, are they getting stiffer, older, broken down? You know when you do a twist or pull a, pull a joint, you're like, ah, that's a picture of like somebody who like gets sideways with somebody and needs to have a reconciliation conversation because our body moves forward when we have healthy joints and parts. You and I doing your share. Are you doing your share here at Grace Church? Your share is in outreach, one of our local outreach teams, or your share is in inreach in ministry right here in discipling with adults, those with special needs, kids and students. Are you doing your share or are you not doing your share? Back to my George example. And so uh, what is this? Well, my George Washington statue sits in my office. George is a knickknack. That's what George is. He's a knickknack. What do knickknacks do? Well, they, they, this one sits in my office, looks nice, collects dust, takes up space, does nothing. Are you a church knickknack? Are you a church knickknack? Are you George? Are you Georging on us right now? So you come to Grace and you look good. We like you well enough, but you take up space, you collect dust, you do nothing. You literally do nothing. You're a body part who's doing nothing right now. Are you Georging? If you're Georging, guess what? You are losing out. God gave you a divine calling, a calling to be part of his kingdom. God gave you a unique spiritual gift set. God gave you pastors and a church body to serve in. You're missing out. And guess what? Grace Church is missing out because we're walking around because you're an eye in the body and you're not serving. And we're like, what, George, get to doing eye stuff. And now we can see because you start serving in ministry. We, got, we can't hear because you're an ear. And God called you to start serving him because you're in here. You're a hand. We can't do anything because we need you to be the hand. Are you Georging right now? You're missing out. I'm missing out. We all are missing out. Guys, God gave you a divine calling from him. You are called by Almighty God to be a part of glorifying Jesus Christ. You are a gifted person with a unique set of spiritual gifts that when you serve in one of our outreach or ministries, the body wins, you win. You've been given pastors to watch over you, to feed you, to take care of you, to lead you, to be models, imperfect as we are. You've been given a local church body and God has called you to help out the church spiritually. Are you doing that? This is not a guilt trip. This is a call to a higher purpose, a call back to God, God gave you those three things and absolutely calls this, are you living your calling? Or you're like, oh, my life's so busy, my life's so busy and something has got to go. We're not adding you, I'm not asking you, we're not asking you to add more to your schedule. Often, that's a terrible idea. What I'm asking you to do is to ask God, what is on your schedule that's the cholesterol, uh, it's the cholesterol that needs to be cleaned out? Because it, as good as it is, or neutral as it is, is clogging up your calendar, clogging up your mind and heart. If you have no time to serve, Guys, I am calling you to a higher purpose, a higher purpose. The goal is this, all of us helping others love and follow Jesus. If we work together, guess what? We're gonna help everyone become an outward focused follower of Jesus. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your calling upon my life and all of our lives as Christians. I thank you so much for the spiritual gift set. We couldn't earn, we couldn't ask for it. They were just chosen by you and given to each one of us. I thank you so much for my pastors as I was growing at my sending church, Graceway. I thank you for the gifts of our pastoral team to our church. God, move in people to get engaged with the kingdom of God, their gifting set to serve you so the body wins, relationships win, the world wins, you get glorified. And I pray for those who don't know Jesus to come to know you. We pray in Jesus' name. Well guys, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you've been encouraged. If you need more information about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, simply go to visitgracechurch.com slash next step. Click the button that says follow Jesus. Until we meet again next time, remember that we love you Jesus loves you, and he wants us to live outward focus this week. I stare into the darkness, skeptical inside.
making promises We both know our lies But there's no need for pride When surrender wins the fight With victory in my bones I'll be singing till morning comes My heart can find its courage Cause I know Even when the night comes I'm not scared Cause even when the night comes I know you'll be there Cause even when the night comes My heart fails I know, I know you'll always be there Even when the night comes Your love is stronger, your love is greater, so what do I have to fear?